Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God Almighty, we, we give you thanks for this chance to, to get some uh, food for the soul. And uh, we know that uh, our soul needs to be nourished in the same way that our bodies do. And so we thank you for this chance to gather together, uh, to be nourished and fed with your word and at the Eucharist, and uh, with some reflections upon the lives of our saints, and the great gift of faith. Uh, Lord, deepen our faith, increase our faith, uh, help us to live our faith more authentically, help us to bear witness to our faith, to bear witness to you uh, in the world around us. And we offer this prayer humbly through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I was sent a little something with this fun picture, and it's a, a picture of a couple of uh, elderly folks. I think that she's supposed to be uh, 80 or so. And uh, they're looking a little frumpy, and it looks like they're sitting on a couch. And the, the, the story goes as, as such. Uh, an 80-year-old woman was arrested uh, for shoplifting in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, when she went uh, before the judge, he asked her, uh, what did you steal? And she replied, a, a can of peaches. And the judge asks her, well, why did you steal a can of peaches? And she said, because I was hungry. And so the judge said, well, how many peaches were in the can? And she said, six. And he says, all right, well, I think I'm going to give you six days in jail. And uh, before everything could finish up, uh, you know, her elderly husband uh, raised his hand and says, judge, may I, may I add a little something to this? And he said, well, certainly. And, uh, and he looked the judge in the eye and he said, well, she also uh, stole a can of peas. <laughs> so, um, it might be somewhat related to my reflection today. Um, but I've entitled the reflection for today, uh, The Real St. Valentine. And... Uh, in, in part, again, because I spent some time in, in Rome and just have uh, come to appreciate in a particular way uh, many of those early Christian martyrs. But obviously, uh, February 14th is just around the corner here. So um, in the, the early accounts of the martyrs, uh, there are actually three different Valentines, St. Valentines. Um, all three suffered martyrdom. Uh, two of them in Rome and one in Africa. And each of them really demonstrated that, that heroic life of those early Christians who were, who were willing in the face of incredible persecution to stand up for Christ and in the end lay down their lives for him. Uh, the more famous uh, St. Valentine was actually a priest and a doctor in Rome. And when one of the great persecutions broke out under the Emperor Claudius in, in, the, in the third century, um, he was clandestinely, secretly, uh, giving all kinds of support, both medical and spiritual, to uh, those who were being persecuted. Uh, but in the end, as you can imagine, he himself was caught and was condemned to death and was uh, beaten with clubs and, and, and the end beheaded for his faith. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, he was, he was buried there and uh, one of the, the popes, Pope Julius I, the, the first built a basilica over his burial site. But uh, around the 13th century, his remains were, were exhumed and taken to uh, another church of uh, St. Uh, Praxedes, which is near the basilica, of the, the major basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. And his remains continue to be there. But they did some excavations in the 13th and the 18th century uh, at the old church and found uh, the um, uh, proof of, of uh, his tomb there. And so, um, uh, you know, so this is uh, another one of the great uh, early martyrs who witnessed to Christ with the gift of his life. 
Um, and that's the story of St. Valentine. Now, the popular custom of showing care and affection for our beloved uh, on St. Valentine's Day is, is actually pretty much purely coincidental with St. Valentine's Day. Uh, and the origin of that, is to, according to, to my uh, discoveries, is that in the Middle Ages, a, a common belief took hold in England and in France that uh, birds mated on February 14th. <laughs> and this was the day when birds began to mate. And so, in fact, Chaucer, this, the, this, the famous Geoffrey Chaucer wrote, uh, for this was on St. Valentine's Day, when every fold cometh there to choose his mate. Right? So, um, so I, that tradition actually developed. And so then the tradition flowed out of that to begin to dedicate that day to lovers and the sending of cards and gifts. And so, uh, in all honesty, the connection between St. Valentine and Valentine's Day, as, as our common culture celebrates it, is very tenuous. And there isn't anything significant related it, to the best of my research. So, that being said, all by way of introduction, um, I actually wanted to take a few moments and reflect with you upon the gift of marriage. That's where I wanted to go today. So, um, the first thing that I want to say is that I, I really believe <laughs> uh, deeply that God promises abundant grace uh, for married couples. And uh, I don't know if we could ever state quite enough, quite often enough or with enough uh, 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 importance, that the first miracle that Jesus performed took place at a wedding. At least in John's Gospel, the first miracle of transforming water into wine took place at a wedding. And the church for 2,000 years has understood that Jesus' presence at that wedding and his desire to, uh, to perform the first of his miracles during his public ministry at that wedding um, is extremely important extremely important. And it's for a Jew, the miracle itself was extremely important because he transformed water into wine. And wine is a very clear Old Testament symbol of joy. And so the grace that Jesus Christ came to bring into this world in a particular way through the cross, because that's where <laughs> the grace comes, through the cross, the grace that Jesus came to bring into this world, if it is going to transform the world, is going to involve a transformation of marriage. And a, a, a giving to marriage of, of a great grace. And so, um, Jesus, you know, as we know, certainly promises uh, his very presence. Uh, and his presence brings healing and strength to us. And he even promised that whenever two or three gather in his name to pray, that he'd be present there. Um, we also know that Jesus promised, uh, as in, in the great uh, moment from the first chapter of Acts, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so... Not only does Christ want to give you uh, uh, power in his name as a married couple to be married, but he also wants to give you that grace to bear witness to him in the world. So that the love of married people is meant to be a witness to the love of God in this world. A second point that I'd like to toss out to you is that... Uh, there is a complementarity in marriage that uh, is really pretty critical to it. And so we know and from the story of creation, which we've been reading in our daily masses recently, that God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
And there is a complementarity between a man and a woman within marriage that is fundamental to what marriage is. Now, the physical complementarity, I think that that's pretty easy for us to grasp, that there, there's a, a physical and sexual complementarity there that is, that is beautiful and, and wonderful, and, and what a great gift. And that element of, of that complementarity uh, has the great potential to bring new life into this world. And I can't imagine that any married person would not uh, attest to the fact that, that children are the, the, the great fruit of their marriage and, the, and often uh, the greatest joy of, of their lives. Um, sometimes they bring a few challenges and uh, maybe a lot of challenges sometimes, uh, but they are uh, a great fruit uh, of, of love in imitation of God. And that's why we call it procreation, because God grants to you this great privilege of allowing your love to so imitate God's love that your love actually creates new life in this world. Now, there is also, I believe, a very strong um, psychological complementarity emotional complementarity and a spiritual complementarity within uh, marriage. And I believe very strongly today that, that we need to more fully appreciate and perhaps grasp and be grateful for this element of complementarity within marriage. Another uh, element to marriage that I'd like to share with you um, it comes from St. Paul, and it's in a, a, a rather famous uh, passage, but he says, um, Be submissive to one another out of reverence for Christ. Be submissive to one another. Um, humility is absolutely essential to marriage. Essential that we need to be submissive to one another. I would say, particularly, um, when the other one is right. <laughs> and that can be hard to do. <laughs> to be submissive to one another when they are in need. Because we all go through moments, for whatever reasons, when there is a great need. And in those moments, to be submissive. Um, I think to be submissive when the other offers a valid challenge to us. If we're not being as charitable or being as understanding or being as loving or being as committed as we need to be. I think we need to be uh, submissive maybe just when it's your turn to be submissive. Because the other one's done it a bunch lately and, and maybe it's time to be submissive. Um, Jesus teaches us in general about the Christian life that there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friend. Uh, St. Paul in uh, the, the same passage uh, from Ephesians, the author to Ephesians says, Husbands, uh, love your wives as Christ loves his bride, the church. And he laid down his life for his bride. Jesus laid down his life for his bride, the church. And so, um, this invitation to, uh, to be submissive. You know, at, at the same time, um, I think that it's uh, also fair to say that I think one of the greatest and most powerful witnesses of Christ in the world is, in fact, um, a married couple. While I was down in, uh, in Fredericksburg and serving as the chaplain at Mary Washington uh, uh, College at the time, which is now the University of Mary Washington, and I was directing the campus ministry program, I had a couple who got very involved with the campus ministry program, uh, Doug and Susan McKenna. And Doug uh, helped me teach uh, my RCIA program. Uh, 
they both uh, jumped in. They, they love to cook. And so we had these, these, these midnight breakfasts in the middle of exam week. And they would come in with all of their stuff. And we would make pancakes and eggs and fruit and all kinds of stuff for the students in the middle of their exams. Um, they started doing a thing where they would invite the, the kids over to their house on a Friday night once a month and teach them how to cook. And they would bring out their finest china. And they would teach these young people how to cook a meal and then sit down at their table set up with the finest that they had. And they would have a conversation about a gospel passage. And they would help me on my retreats. And so they came on the retreat, and I'll, I'll never forget the first retreat that they helped me out with. Uh, and I think that it was on Friday or Saturday night, and they came to me right before the end of the evening, and they said, can we do something a little different with the kids, something that we used to do at home? And I'm like, sure. And so when they, with their children at home, every night they would, they would you know, pray with their kids before they went to bed. And they would just commend their children to, to bed, and they would make the sign of the cross on their kid's forehead. And so at the end of the night, they went around as a couple to each kid in, our, in, our, in a circle in our, on this retreat. And they said a prayer with them, and they made the sign of the cross on their forehead. There was great weeping in that room. And these kids felt loved in a very powerful way. And this couple, they loved one another, and it oozed out of them. And I, I think that they were an enormous sense, um, cause of healing and hope for the kids in that campus ministry program. Because they were, were able to show young people today who don't see enough of this that marriage can work and that when marriage is rooted in God and done properly, it's incredible and it really is life-giving. And I believe that this couple was one of the best weapons I had at Mary Washington while I was there. The power of a good Christian marriage. The witness in this world. And I know that marriage is difficult. I know that. I, you know, I grew up in a home, and my parents had a fabulous marriage, but <laughs> there are times when it's tough, and I know that. The church knows that. But that's why Christ promises His grace. And so I, I share this with you today to, uh, to encourage you in your marriages. I want to finish with uh, a great line, uh, hopefully fairly well known to you, from Proverbs uh, 31. When one finds a worthy wife, her value is beyond pearls. Her husband, entrusting his heart to her, has an unfailing prize. She brings him good and not evil all the days of her life. She obtains wool and flax and makes cloth with skillful hands. Like merchant ships, she secures provisions from afar. She is girt about with strength, and sturdy are her arms. I invite, uh, invite you, uh, my dear friends, to, uh, to uh, grow anew and reinvest and to recommit to and to dive into and to appreciate uh, ever more uh, the gift of marriage and the gift of your wives. And uh, if there were w women here, I would say your husbands also. But, um, and, and may God bless and strengthen uh, all of our marriages with his promised grace. Amen. Thank you, guys.